Hello and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. I am your host, Kirsten Howe, and um, I'm really glad you're here today. Alzheimer's is and other forms of dementia are, are a big deal nowadays. There's lots of research happening into what causes dementia, how to treat it, how to prevent it. Dementia affects many of our clients at Absolute Trust Council. So um, this research and everything that's happening in that field is very important and interesting to us. What we are gonna talk about today is art therapy, which is a fascinating alternative approach to treating and living with dementia. Now, my guest today is Angel C. Duncan, and she has an extensive background in counseling, psychology, art therapy, and Alzheimer's disease research. Her education and clinical work began at Stanford, right here in the Bay Area, and she later became programs director for the Alzheimer's Association and rehabilitation clinician at UCSF. Um, in New York City and New Jersey, she developed wellness support programs for dementia populations, and she secured grants for homelessness and seniors living in isolation. In New Haven, she was the director of a graduate art therapy and counseling program and co-developed Arts in Mind, a young onset early stage Alzheimer's program at Yale University Art Gallery, which we're gonna to talk to her about in this episode. Um, in Florida, she was research associate and director of education for the Neuropsychiatric Research Center of Southwest Florida. She teaches part-time at University of Tampa, and she's also a consultant with various agencies in brain, neuro, in brain health initiative in the US, in the UK, in Europe, and Southeast Asia. She presents on neurocognitive disease and mental health and is a widely published author. She, current, she resides on the medical advisory board for Lorenzo's House and on the board of directors for the Cognitive Dynamics Foundation and also serves as their executive arts director. She has such a deep and wide um, breadth of experience in this area. And so we're so fortunate to have her here uh, today as our guest. Thank you, Angel, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, it's the pleasure is ours, honestly. So. Um, so let's start by talking about some of the research in this area that that demonstrates the impact of art or or creativity on the brain and mental and emotional well-being. Maybe you can give us some examples of what's happening in this world. It's an exciting time for research on all aspects from disease, looking at disease modifying modalities to how we're interacting in life creatively. And I would say probably in the past 10 years, there's been an influx of interest and in research in the arts and how it supports mental health and neurological disease. And Dr. Jean Cohen, the late uh, geriatric psychiatrist who's championed his work in the field, um, was per, I would say was the first physician to really put the importance of art therapy on the map. He did a longitudinal study, many studies, both with and without dementia that showed that just engaging weekly in the arts support mental health. And for those with dementia, they are helping to improve mood and behavior. They're relying less on PRN as needed medications, psychotropic, dr psychotropic drugs, which is the big one that we're trying to reduce because there's such an overuse of that. And um, we're seeing regions, it's, you know, with Alzheimer's and related dementias, it's not curing it. But what we're doing is we're helping to preserve quality of life. We're enriching those moments and giving them the opportunities because we're also seeing that those living with dementia in, an art th in the art therapy world, long-term memories are coming back. There, right. you know, and that's what research is showing. We're, we're able to now evidentially prove that the arts work. <laughs> yes, and and an interesting thing you said there is that studies have shown that the arts are good for mental health in people who aren't dementia patients. 
as well as um, helping people um, maybe have a, just a, a better quality of life in the, in the dementia world. Um, how does that, how does that work? What, what is happening there when, when um, arts being used to, to assist people who are suffering with dementia? What is happening in the brain, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There, you know, there's two major studies that were done in the past few years. And one was funded by the Templeton Foundation where they looked at 405 participants, older adults. And just by looking at their brain scans, they could tell you who was creative and who was not. And Nancy Adrizen, a physician in Seattle, one of my champions, did, she's very big in the research and in the arts, and she found a similar study that the Templeton found. So they're seeing by when you're engaging in it, you have thicker, there's parts of your brain that are becoming thicker in its regions. You have the left and the right hemispheres that are working more together. So we're, we're seeing faster synapses, faster connections. Things are starting to interplay. It's like this chemical soup in the brain that's kind of connecting. And what we're also finding in the frontal temporal lobe, your executive powerhouse, your functioning, there's some sharper um, snaps is happening in those regions as well. Those connections are firing and it's helping, you know, and we're what we're also seeing by tapping into these certain regions of the brain, we're finding people are becoming more flexible in their thinking approaches. They're more open. They're more curious in life. They want to focus on what I'm going to be doing next as opposed to past experiences. So there's some, no, there's just, now, there's just a bunch of a, a, a very enriched information that we're doing that's helping that mind, body, spirit connection. And those living with dementia, you're getting the same, you know, that same kind of juice and activation, that productivity. Okay. Okay. And, and so how does that, um, does that manifest in um, something that we can perceive from you know, I'm not saying this right. You know, somebody somebody with dementia is engaged in art therapy. What are we seeing on the outside? What kind of, how, how does that affect? Yeah, I, I, think I, get, I think I get what you're saying. Um, <laughs> I'm being very inarticulate. Yeah, sorry, no, um, you know, you're, you're seeing, to, you're seeing connections, relationship connections. You know, caregivers, whether or not you're professional or a family member, you're creating empathy because you're getting to learn more about each other in different ways. So when I'm working with somebody living with dementia, their art that they're creating nine times out of 10 actually means something. So you process that as an art therapist, I'm going to ask them, tell me about this, even if it's abstract and you see a sense of calm. So people that are agitated or have, you know, they're agitated, they're, full of anxiety and depressed, you know, a lot of depression, you see those mood lift that, you know, in the beginning I have residents that will say, I don't want to do this. I'm not an artist. I don't draw. I don't do this. And they're, and they're agitated and they're hesitant. And they kind of some with some gentle coaxing, we sit down and we start to paint and we, we make the art and I'm talking, tell me about this, you know, and then memories are coming back. And by the end of the session, they're like, this was so much fun. I loved this. And it's so you, you are physically seeing a change in their behavior and their mood and just feeling like this sense of belonging and a sense of pride and accomplishment in what they created. You know, I'll hold up their art and they'll go, I did that. <laughs> it's like, yes, you did this, you know, and it's just, uh, there's just so much benefit that I think it's a two way street between the care provider and those that we serve. Right, right. And and you did mention um, how in this country, I think it's fair to say we are, we tend to be very drug oriented in our approach to, to health and medicine and drugs are easy to prescribe, easy to take. Um, but for a lot of reasons, they're not always the best solution every time. And we have been reading for a number of years about the overuse of in particular psychotropic drugs in, and I'm focusing on in nursing homes because that's you know a part of the demographic that I um, deal with. Can you talk about um, perhaps how art could be used 
as a an alternative to that. Absolutely. There are some great studies in the past few years that have come out that show that we're getting the same benefits from art music that you would from Haldol or Seroquel or these antipsychotic drugs. So, and you're right, it's easy to just, oh, here's a quick fix, just let's control the behavior. So it's like, yes, you are sedating the behavior, but you're diminishing quality of life. And, right. and that, that's such an important point. It, yes, yeah. exactly. And so it's important that we're just, we're giving the opportunity. And, you know, a lot of these psychotropic drugs have what's called a black box warning label. They are not designed to be given to people living with dementia on a chronic basis. I've seen, you know, when I was at the research center here working in clinical trials, we had patients come in that were on high doses of Seroquel that just went straight down. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're, you, you're, you, you sedate the behavior, you, you did a good job doing that, but this person is no longer really functioning. So the art are it's dignifying and it's just taking that opportunity to connect and it's amazing what they do create you know watercolor is actually one of the best mediums to use with this population from an art therapy perspective because there's something about the fluidity of it that taps into that subconsciousness and those memories start to resurface and all these rich stories come out i had a woman um in naples florida who we were just stunned. She painted just an apple tree that ended up being her mother's apple trees that she grew to a conversation about how she wondered if she married the right person in life. Oh, wow. That's not yeah. a conversation no. you expect to have with someone in in the throes of dementia. Yeah, exactly. And wow. the CNA care for happened to be getting married and was like, tell me about this. What, what, <laughs> what, what were you looking for in a man, you know? And, um, <laughs> So they started having a conversation about relationships and then it changed their dynamics. I noticed that the CNA started treating her, you know, a little bit more with compassion and empathy. And it was just amazing to watch the shift in care as she got to know the person that she was caring for on a more intimate level. Right. In the, in the art, it kind of enabled the patient to access a, a part of her and share that with her caregiver. Um, and that, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. You know, yeah. it, the caregiver in that case was a professional, um, but it could have been a family member. And to have that person back, so to speak, you know, they've been gone. They've been in their dementia box and to have them back in a conversation, what a gift that must be for a family. It is. We had um, another couple who we, we do these museum programs and we had one in Naples where it was a husband and wife and they were looking at a still life and she drew this beautiful picture of a green vase and flowers and he drew his thumb and he said, it's Tom's thumb next to the green thumb. And he said, without my wife, I'd be nobody and how much he loved her and how much he made his life better. And she started crying at the end of the session. And she's like, this was the first time that he said he loved me in over two years since his oh, diagnosis. Right, yeah. So what a wonderful thing that was for both of them. Yeah. Now, um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, you've been working in a number of different avenues at educating physicians and other medical care providers um, on this idea of utilizing alternative therapies. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of your work in that in that yes. effort. Yeah, for almost 20 years, I have been beating down the door saying, you gotta take this seriously. It's not a pastime. Fortunately, I have the good graces of partnering with like-minded professionals who are physicians. So Jerry, you know, psychiatrist and neurologist. So Dr. Um, Daniel Potts is a neurologist who is, uh, he is one of the main advocates in the field who started his program, Bringing Art to Life. He and I co-developed that in 2010. And as a neurologist, he will be the first to say, we do not do a good job in treating this disease. And he has been the voice, I think, of reason with his peers, along with ne Neelam Agarwal, Dr. Agarwal's at Rush University in Chicago. And the three of us have really been able to align our work from counseling psychology and art therapy to neurology. And how do we really treat this from a 
medical and psychosocial model and combine that together to treat the whole person. So with their help of these two individuals and people like Gronin at Miami Jewish Health System, um, these like-minded physicians are becoming peers and really actually challenging and teaching one another in their field saying, we need to do a better job. And so we've been fortunate to have quite a few universities welcome us to bring our, so it's a course, we have a course that we teach for a semester and we teach medical residents and pre-med majors and diverse majors, nursing, social workers, students, from all walks of life, we give them a course education on Alzheimer's and related dementias, and then we get to pair them up at a residential facility where they get to work in an art therapy session with an art therapist. And it changes, it's enriching their education, it's creating empathetic care as a physician, and we're seeing this as such a need, and the benefits and the surveys that we're getting, we did a, a research study at Rush on med resident empathy, and we found that after our course was taught, scores skyrocketed. They felt more empathy towards their patients they were working with than before. Oh, and that's always a good thing. Uh, empathy is always a, always a really good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I would think. Um, and you've been doing this program through Rush for a while. Well, we started, yeah, we actually started at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa oh. at the undergraduate honors college. Dr. Potts and I, yeah, we co-developed it. We pitched the idea at UA Tuscaloosa. They were all over it and said, yes, let's do it. Now it's in their psychology part, uh, department. And then Rush University said, Neelam Agarwal, Dr. Agarwal said, yes, we're doing this. We need to do this. And then um, we're doing another program with some students who were in the program um, several years ago in New Orleans. They're doing an outpatient center. So we're starting to kind of get our hands into other places, but it's actually started in UA Tuscaloosa. Okay. And um, just to be clear, uh, you and I talked about this off mic, but um, when we say art, you know, the art therapy that you are engaged in generally has to do with, um, you know, drawing, painting, that vein. Um, but I think that maybe it's important to point out that um, it's really kind of about creativity and it could be other types of art. Am I, am I saying that correctly? Is no, that absolutely. Yeah. From, you know, from an art therapy perspective, you know, it is, you know, it's a master's level of education. You're taking studio art techniques and combining it with psychology, psychotherapy um, approaches, but art does not necessarily mean just getting out watercolors and pencils. You know, it's creativity. It can be, you know, it's things that are your passions in life. It can be photography. It can be, you know, sewing, knitting, uh, writing, working in the garden, um, you know, playing an instrument. It's whatever that craft is for you and living your life creatively. You know, an art therapist is, you know, that art therapy aspect field is it's combining the studio art techniques with the counseling psychology. Yeah. So it is a different kind of category. But then when we think of creativity in general and how it does benefit the brain, it is. It's all forms that you're doing to challenge your mind in a good way. Yeah. And, and I just bring that up because I understand art therapy is a certain uh, it's a certain format and it's got to be done a certain way with people who have that training and certification. Um, but if we're also thinking about, well, you know, what are the things that we everyday people can do if we are just trying to be as healthy brain wise as we can be you know we've for many years heard about oh you should do crossword puzzle every day <laughs> i don't know what you think of i see you're kind of rolling no. out. what do you know <laughs> we've got so there yeah there are so i mean it you know brain games are big business and you just you, you need to be careful who your experts are be careful what the claims are you know anything that says you anything with the words prevent uh -huh. you know, ward off, fend off, there's no such thing. You can do things to reduce your risk. You know, what are things I can live my life to reduce our risk? Genetics can also play a factor. So it's living your life creatively and to its fullest, but being careful of, of you know, some what, what, what some of these claims are. And crosswords, yeah, you got, 
you know, there's, there's, you know, if you enjoy it and it challenges you, great, do it. I do them. I love them. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, but it's, you know, it's just a variety of, and maybe I'm biased, but I do, I think that the arts and creativity are essential to, it's part of your lifestyle. And I think it's essential to have that because it's giving you meaning and purpose. Right. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. I do crossword puzzles just because I do them, not because I think, oh, I'll never get Alzheimer's if I do this every day. No. We know that's not that's not how it works. But all right. Now, this is the time in the episode where we are going to resurrect our um, Ask Kirsten segment. Back in the day when we did this just as an audio podcast, we had an Ask Kirsten segment. And then when we went to Facebook Live, we dropped it. I don't know why, I, probably because I screwed something up. But anyway, we're going to resurrect that because we do get emails from you know, clients, people who aren't our clients. We get emails with questions, and I want to answer those questions. And so we're going to go to one of our email questions, just one. Bear with me. And this is a question for me. Um, the question that I have is from Maria in Danville. And Maria's written, um, my mother is 79 and was recently told by her doctor that she has dementia. She still seems fine most of the time, but I know that will change. So I've been trying to get her to meet with an attorney to do estate planning, but she is resisting that and she has no estate plan and I'm not sure what to do. Um, first of all, thank you, Maria, for your question for um, participating here. Uh, that's tricky. We can't really make people do things that they don't want to do, and that can be tricky. But what I would say is you might try just talking to her about maybe if we met with an attorney just to, um, this is what we sometimes do, create a, a power of attorney that would enable you, Maria, to help your mom do estate planning. She might just not want to be involved in that process. She might not want to have to worry about, it, but if she could maybe have the possibility of putting that on your desk um, with her involvement, but not having to do all that work, that might help. So a lot of times that's the first step we take when we're meeting with a new client who's got a dementia diagnosis is we just kind of create the legal possibility for someone else to help them with their estate planning. So that would be my advice. And thank you, Maria, for your question. If you have a question that you'd like to have answered on the Ask Kirsten segment, just email it to us, info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. Um, we have on our website a whole lot of information, resources about incapacity planning. So. Um, Check that out on absolutetrustcouncil.com. There's a tab there called incapacity planning, and you might find some of that helpful. All right. Thank you. We're back to the, <laughs> to the real stuff, the, the interesting stuff. Now, we've gotten now to the part that I really wanted to talk to you about, Angel, which is um, the program that you do with the Yale University Art Gallery. It, it's just fascinating and wonderful. And I just want you to talk about that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so there's so many programs for those living in the moderate to later stages of the disease. And those that are in the young onset and very early stages are oftentimes left in the dark. And I saw that routinely while I was at the research center, you know, working, you know, in the clinic. And we were the only outlet for these individuals and families. So we started thinking about doing museum tours for them. You know, let's have something where they can go to because, you know, I have somebody who's 57 years old and he says, I can't be with my, I, it's hard going golfing with my friends now because I can't keep up with the, the scores. I'm repeating myself. I can't remember what's, you know, and, and they're embarrassed. And so that's, you know, and they're losing their self-esteem and their self-confidence. So it's a place for people to come together where the stigma is out the door. 
Nobody cares if you repeat yourself. You know, this is going to be a place of dignity. So in 2019, I approached the Yale University Art Gallery, Jessica Sachs. She's the um, senior curator of public education. And I reached out to her and she immediately got back and was like, I love this. We, you know, they already have a program for a moderate to late stage. Nothing for young, for nothing for young onset. Yeah. So and then Rachel Thompson, who was the museum fellow there for four years, who just now is at the Guggenheim. Very exciting. Um, the three of us co-developed it together. So the three of us co-developed Arts and Mind and we offered it once a month. We actually partnered with the Yale University um, Alzheimer's Disease Unit. So they were sending over their participants from their trials to the gallery. And then just word of mouth in the community, we ended up having, I think, almost 15, 20 people. And it was amazing. And then COVID hit. COVID, yeah. Of course. And we're just like. I knew you, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Shift so it all came to a screeching halt. Yeah. And then I was doing a lot of things virtually. And I thought, you know, why aren't we doing this virtually? So I reached out to Jessica and Rachel and was like, hey, can we can we offer it virtual? And they're like, yes, they're already doing virtual programs. Let's do it. So we opened it up virtually, which has actually been a blessing because now we have couples from all over the country. Right. Yeah. That participate. I, so, yeah. yeah. So we, we, hold, we hold it once a month. And the beautiful thing is that it's working with Jessica, who's a museum educator. She knows things I don't know. And then me being the art therapist and, you know, and the clinician behind the disease, we meet up and we meet with students as well, art therapy students, museum education students, and students that are going into medicine. And we talk about, we pick out art pieces from the gallery and we have a theme and then we highlight it. We show the theme, we get them engaged. Jessica does her magic and creates this beautiful conversation with everybody. And then at the end, we'll do it. I'll give an art therapy directive. You know, I'll give a choice. I'll give two or three different things they can do. And they spend maybe 25, 30 minutes making art. And then they all share it and they share what it means to them. And because it's been going so well, Yell ended up extending the program for another year Fantastic. to go virtual. That's yeah, fantastic. so it's just, it's been, we're, I think we're meeting needs in a very unique way that's reaching students and medical professions as well as the couples who direly need these types of programs and offering them something that's dignifying. So you, okay, so in a typical, you say you do these about once a month, in a typical online session, you're going to have perhaps a, a, a bunch of married couples or or the patient and their caregiver, whatever relationship they have with mm -hmm. their caregiver, their family member, whoever it is. So the, the spouse is also participating in your workshop, in your art therapy workshop. Um, so what kinds of, you said you talk about it afterwards, and what kinds of reactions do you get from those spouses? That's what is interesting to me. Yeah, there, it's been a really nice place um, for, for spouses and caregivers too. It's giving them something to do. And it's and as we talked about earlier, it's giving them the opportunity to have their their partner, in, you know, in that hour. It's, you know, I, I'm not a caregiver. This is this is my partner. And we're having a shared experience. And afterwards, I am just, I get emails, I've gotten phone calls of just gratitude. And you can see it too, because even on Zoom, we'll sit there and observe and watch the interactions. And um, we have a, a couple where we have some of the spouses that are so used to talking for their loved one. Sure. Yeah, they're so used to talking for their loved one that you can almost see them taken back when. <laughs> They, they start taking control of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. they were going or, to talk about their own piece of art that they just Exactly, made, yes. They're going to talk about it themselves instead of deferring to their spouse. Yeah. Exactly, so they're, yeah, so it's it's just kind of this wonderful moment of where, you know, they're, they're exercising abstract thinking that they normally, I don't think, are getting in their day-to-day -day routine, but it's like, they're able to actually really talk about what they like or dislike about a, an art piece. And then they're drawing. I, we had one couple last week who she's like, this is the first time he ever drew people. He's never drawn in people. 
he drew a couple, you know, and it was, um, it was just a fun moment, but there's also a lot of humor, you know, mm -hmm. the things that you, sometimes they're having a little too, well, T's like, you're having a little too much fun over there. I can't wait to see what you drew, you know? So <laughs> it's just, um, it's been a, a wonderful compliment, I think, for, for everyone that's involved yeah, and it's free. We don't charge for the program. It's free. So anyone can attend. Oh, really? Okay. So that's through Yale University Art Gallery and mm -hmm. um, people can look for that and and access it. That's I love to hear about things that are free. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so Angel, before I let you go, I do want to talk to you about you, you have a symposium coming up and I, I want to hear a little bit about that if you would if you're willing to share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is I'm excited. This is the first year that the 12th annual Expressive Therapy Summit is hosting um, a first ever neurosciences and aging symposia and track series for aging populations and the focus is primarily on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And I was asked to chair that. So I've been sharing and coordinating this event. And I've got 11 speakers, professionals from all over the country that are doing amazing work in various aspects of the, of the field. And there'll be workshops, uh, the film screening of I Remember Better When I Paint. And uh, there'll be a lecture series with neurologist Daniel Potts and workshops with Botavia, MindRamp, uh, Yell, and um, all kinds, all of the, so it's um, going to happen in November. It's virtual and it's also going to be in Atlantic City, but it's the Expressive Therapy Summit Fall Conference. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Okay. So before, before I let you go, though, I do have some questions in the audience. So you're going to have to <laughs> sit tight for a little bit longer. Sure. Um, all right. So, oh, okay. So this first one is, is your symposium just for professionals or is it open to the general public it's open anyone it's it's a wonderful conference that is an array of all the expressive arts and anybody interested in the arts is welcome to to register all right thank you thank you that's i'm gonna have to check that out myself um okay another question do you find art therapy to be helpful in all forms of dementia including some of the less common ones like lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia? Um, great question. That's, that's a great question. Yeah. It is a great question. And yes, all of the above. In fact, the majority of, of the people I work with are all mixed. It's mixed dementia. I have, you know, the woman who was getting, um, who talked about marrying the right person, she had FTD. She had frontal temporal lobe, mixed disease. And um, so, yeah, I've worked with Lewy body, um, Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's oh. vascular, all of the above. Okay. That's interesting. It's mm -hmm. It's just helpful, no matter no matter the cause of your dementia. Um, it's a helpful alternative therapy that obviously needs to be more utilized. <laughs> and that's your mission. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angel, for being with us today. I I learned so much. I think my audience also did, and I really laud you for the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much. This is always great to be able to spread the word. Thank you. You are welcome. And um, thank you all for being here, um, for listening. I really appreciate you being here. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our eBooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting absolutetrustcouncil.com slash scheduling. Don't forget to keep an eye out for our next live episode in two weeks. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon.